in the middle of the 1980s, the end of the Soviet Union was nigh. Decades of conflict and a stagnant economy. A change was needed, and the glasnost policies of Mikhail Gorbachev began the process. A move away from state censorship and the oppression of free speech, and a realization that technology was starting to make the complete control of information impossible. The miniaturization and cost reduction of microprocessors paved the way for the rise of the microcomputers in the late 1970s. These cheap 8-bit machines had crude graphics and even cruder sound, but it didn't matter. For the first time, computers were becoming commonplace in homes. First found in the hands of hobbyists, the earliest micros were sold in kit form. But later products like the Apple II and Atari 8-bit range broke into mass-market appeal. Many were bought with the intent of settling home accounts or working out of the office. But invariably, the most compelling feature was the games. Unlike consoles, microcomputers were programmable. With the right know-how, you had everything you needed to create your own software from scratch. An invisible cottage industry emerged passionate individuals with a love of games, and the curiosity to master this new hardware. The dawn of the bedroom programmer. Finally, the means of video game production in the hands of the people. With the widespread distribution of computers, surprisingly popular games can spring from unexpected places. The best known Soviet contribution to the interactive arts was a game developed by Alexei Pajitnov in 1984, whilst working as an artificial intelligence researcher at the Dorodnitsyn Computing Center in Moscow. Tetris is a puzzle game based on the arrangement of falling tiles, tetrominoes comprising various arrangements of four squares. The game requires that you arrange a sequence of these tiles to form contiguous rows, and upon successful assembly, the lines disappear, supplementing your score and granting more room to manoeuvre. A surprisingly addictive game emerges from these simple rules, and its early popularity led to Western publishers clamouring for its licence rights. Tetris was the first entertainment software to be exported from the USSR to the West, and how it was marketed is an interesting reflection of the attitude of the time. The original game was quite spartan, a text-only monochrome display, no music, nothing superfluous to the gameplay. However, in the West, the game's exotic origin was trumpeted at every turn. Festooned with a hammer and sickle, faux Cyrillic lettering, Russian imagery from cosmonauts to the Kremlin, and in the case of the Game Boy version, a particularly catchy version of a Russian folk song. It's this handheld version that helped to establish Tetris's popularity, with the game included as a long-standing pack-in with the Game Boy. It's simple yet addictive gameplay, the perfect fit for the shorter gameplay sessions of handheld play. Even today, Tetris remains a popular title, and you'd be hard-pushed to find a platform that doesn't have its own version. With near universal availability, the game from beyond the Iron Curtain defied the odds and became one of the most important games in history. From Russia with fun. As millions built with blocks in Tetris, millions more sought to tear down a divisive wall. The revolutions of 1989 spread across communist Europe, with a weakened Soviet Union ousted in favour of democracy. The close of the Iron Curtain, an autumn of nations. The USSR was formally dissolved in 1991, the event which marks the end of the Cold War. The world had seen massive change over its duration. The advent of modern computing, man's first journey to outer space, the mass adoption of television, and the cultivation of weapons of mass destruction. Not least of all, the birth of a new industry the product of a half-century of research, and already an established part of popular entertainment. Video games had truly come of age. 
Their formative years had seen them moulded by the political events of the Cold War, and some of the conventions established then persist today. Beyond the broad themes, space, nuclear tension, and the fear of annihilation, 40 years of conflict has had some subtler influences. Games are littered with Cold War cliches, even down to the simplest element. The need for an opponent leads to a distinction of two or more sides, and even the colours used evoke images of propaganda. Red versus Blue both primary colours, and both distinct. Perhaps it's just a convention that stuck. But enemies are often red, and most players will instinctively avoid them without instruction. A convenience for game designers. A trope repeated without question. The good guys shoot blue lasers, the bad guys shoot red lasers. There are very few groups who make convincing enemies without causing too much upset and it seems as though Russians are first pick from the gallery of evil. Of course, a good bad guy must dress the part, and so military greatcoats, ushankas and hammer and sickle flags are all standard issue. A thick Russian accent is a must too, along with an enduring loyalty to the motherland. The evil Soviet stereotype can turn up anywhere, and frequently does but is most at home within the political tension of the late 20th century. Considering the influence of the Cold War in video games, it's perhaps surprising that more games aren't set within it. Perhaps it's the lack of conventional action. Most fighting was via proxy wars, such as in Korea and Vietnam, and few such conflicts had as satisfactory an end as World War II, nor one particularly flattering to the Americans. When these theatres are depicted, the focus is normally on special forces rather than regular troops. Stories of subterfuge during secret missions. Such tales are filled with far more intrigue. Delicate operations with high stakes. Emphasising the romantic idea that the heroic few can influence the fates of many. The 90s were a dynamic time for video games an emergence from novel diversion to multi-billion dollar industry. We saw technology evolve, with the first machines powerful enough to render 3D scenes in real time, dedicated GPUs and CD-ROM storage enabling recorded voice, soundtracks and full motion video. As the scope of production increased, small groups of hobbyist programmers coalesced into ever larger studios. The industry blossomed in the areas that had invested most into technology education. America, Japan, Europe and Russia. It's no coincidence that the majority of games are made in the first and second world. The 1990s officially ended with a damp squib of millennium celebration. We'd have to wait nearly two more years for the true end of an era. An uninvited awakening that served as a reminder of a fragile world. 9-11 changed everything. From fear to fascination. And back again. Hey, isn't this danger close for the With two monuments to America toppled, after the shock subsided, a collective lust for revenge emerged. As one war ended, another began. This time, a war on terror. And if you thought nuclear war was futile, try fighting an abstract concept. Nevertheless, America found an enemy in Iraq. Action broadcast live on 24-hour news. The world witnessed to an invasion, live from the front lines. A new us versus a new them. And this time, it was personal. Terrorists entered the stable of acceptable opponents. Ushanka's shed for Kefir instead. The stage set for a new theater. Modern warfare. The fear of a Soviet strike replaced with something even less predictable. An errant arsenal in the hands of terrorists with nothing to lose. A nuke by any other name. Weapons of mass destruction. WMDs cover a broad spectrum of threats nuclear, chemical, or biological. 
united by their capacity to do harm. A small device in a densely populated area could be devastating, and a strike could come anywhere, at any time. Of course, the threat of terrorism is incredibly small, perhaps not worthy of the attention paid to it. But like the elevated fear of shark attacks that followed the release of Jaws, humans are not best known for their rational behaviour. Some fears are more justified than others, and what could rouse more terror than the possibility of one's web history being made public? Governments rely on mass surveillance to curb potential terror threats, and our lives are becoming increasingly searchable online. Privacy has become a major political issue. Such themes have become quite common in video games, as surveillance cameras and hacking lend themselves well to gameplay. Cameras can work both ways, particularly in stealth games. Avoiding their slow-moving cone of vision to avoid detection, or accessing a security console to gain insight of threats that lie ahead. Hacking is something which is almost never depicted accurately, and games are no exception, normally using the activity as an excuse to add a puzzle-based minigame. Still, these mechanics can help diversify playstyles, an element of strategy in games which may otherwise be dominated by brawn, and in some cases can serve as a social commentary on the potential risks of unwarranted surveillance. Some technological threats lurk menacingly on the horizon, yet to come to fruition. The idea of a rogue artificial intelligence has been a long present facet of fiction, from HAL 9000 to the Terminator, there exists a wariness of killer machines. Perhaps it's not surprising then that some reservations have been expressed about the combat use of autonomous drones loaded with missiles. For now, these platforms are governed by a human operator, but even remote-controlled weapons platforms are not free of ethical dilemma. It's no doubt safer for the pilots to be removed from the action, but killing by proxy almost seems unsporting. More troubling is the expansion of such weapons autonomy. Should a machine be allowed to make its own assessment of targets, would it ever be wise to grant full fire control to an algorithm? Perhaps it's an unfounded fear based on decades of science fiction. But AI has no problems beating humans at chess. And war might not be much different. If knowledge is power, then technology is its weapon. From longbows at Agincourt to the machine guns, tanks and aircraft of the 20th century, technology and war are inseparably intertwined. A chain reaction ignited by our greatest hopes and darkest fears. The information age was built on Cold War technology, and culture, like war, has a thirst for communication. The rise of television has kept us fed with a stream of news. Now, major political events resonate louder than ever, with works of fiction exploring the fear and consequences of real-world actions. Video games are not exempt. Games which explore the topic of war are commonplace, and some of the most popular titles in recent years are a mirror image of recent conflicts. When the computing technology that drives them has roots in military research, the link might be uncomfortably close for some. To condemn war is not to condemn video games. For all their violent imagery, they are just a reflection of reality. Games appeal to mankind's competitive nature. A chance to tell a hero's tale of valour or to serve as a warning of humanity's folly. War might yield a terrible crop. Death, destruction, terror. But even from these bitter roots, something wonderful can emerge. A product of war, but for the purpose of peace. An unintended harvest. A nuclear fruit.
Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, farewell. <laughs>